by the way, I appreciate the message Danny brought last week when I was out of town, and I went back and watched it online. He did a good job and uh, really spoke to my heart, and uh, he was, uh, hit the nail on the head with what he had to say. So thank you, Danny, for that message. That helped me, encouraged me. Uh, but anyhow, you did a good job. We're in the Gospel of Mark. We're journeying through. If you notice, I titled your uh, message tonight, No More Barriers. <laughs> uh, all around us, we know that there's barriers. Uh, all of our life, we see uh, that there, uh, there are barriers, or have to be barriers. There's some barriers that uh, are unnecessary. There's some barriers that we appreciate. There's some barriers uh, that we don't appreciate, especially if it's uh, something that we want to do and it seems like that it's out of, out of bounds, so to speak. Uh, but we know that uh, God never intended for the law to be a barrier. Uh, he gave those Ten Commandments as a, as a rule, so to speak, or guidance so that we would know how to behave in our relationship to God. It wasn't about do's and don'ts. It wasn't that He was trying to limit us in what we did. Uh, he said there are some things that would be better if, they, if you did uh, barricade yourself from those things because they can bring harm. And if you look at all ten of those commandments, uh, it's so true. But when you look at what the Jewish people did, uh, they added a hundred and some uh, several, 300 more laws to what he established. I mean, they, they just got plumb ridiculous with the law. You couldn't cook certain things on the Sabbath. Uh, you couldn't burn food on the Sabbath. You couldn't uh, travel a certain distance. You couldn't spit on the ground. I mean, it went on and on and on and on and on. It's almost like you were scared to live. Uh, but looking at the law in another aspect, uh, we know that the law was about sacrifice. And we know that there was a, a portrait of Jesus Christ coming through the Old Testament system. It wasn't just that he, God just designed that for no reason. Uh, the offering of that lamb or that uh, goat or that sacrifice had great significance because every bit of that pointed to Jesus coming. And we find once again that they begin to fabricate what God had designed and turn it into their own ritualistic types of worship. Now, as you get to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, uh, verse 33, we're in those last hours of the life of Jesus. We've been studying in Sunday school, and I've tried not to uh, overlap the lesson so it wouldn't be so boring, uh, boring, so to speak, to you. But we're going to pick up in chapter 15, verse 33, uh, and it says, And when the sixth hour was come, that being noon, there was darkness over the whole land unto the ninth hour, which, of course, would be three in the afternoon. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, uh, he called Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. When the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Notice verse 40. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him, and ministered to him, and many other women, which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Now, uh, as you understand what's happened here, 2,000 years ago, uh, Jesus uh, stormed the beaches of, of hell's portals and won the battle over sin as he yielded his life on the cross. Uh, what Jesus did in those last six hours of his life made it possible for you and I uh, to be forgiven of our sins and to be for saved from the penalty of our sin. And one day that we'll be saved ultimately from the presence of sin. And uh, w uh, what a day that will be as we just sang. Uh, not only will we be, we'll be healed physically, but listen, we'll be, we're already being healed spiritually, but we're going to experience the ultimate healing. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, the book of Revelation says. Well, in these last hours, I want you to look at a couple things tonight in this text. First of all, uh, Jesus begins to show us the loneliness of sin. Uh, look in verse 33. 
Uh, first of all, we see the darkness that's related to sin. The darkness of sin. Uh, he, he said, uh, and, and when the six hours come, there was darkness. Now some have tried to fabricate or excuse the fact of this darkness. Some say that, uh, uh, that there was a, a, a great dust storm that caused this to happen. Some say, uh, as you look on the more conservative side, some say that that darkness was to hide the naked body of Jesus from public humiliation. Well, that could be so, I don't know. Uh, but some say uh, that actually uh, he, there, we find that that darkness came over the earth, uh, the whole land, because he has taken on the sin of the world. And I believe that's probably the proper interpretation of this darkness. Why? Because the scriptures prophesied that it would take place. Amos chapter 8 verse 9 said, Amos the prophet of the Old Testament said, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. So in broad daylight there will be darkness. And he's prophesying here that the darkness will be in the time of our Lord's death on Calvary. So, as you understand that, keep in mind, uh, as Jesus shows us the loneliness of sin here uh, in, in this particular uh, uh, setting, uh, we see the darkness uh, of sin uh, that is portrait here. You know, an announcement that God's firstborn and beloved Son, the Lamb of God, was given His life for the sins of the world was made. And we know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Listen to what the writer of 2 Corinthians, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Another reference that we can jot down here if you take notes. He says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. That's why there was darkness, because he became sin for you and I, who knew no sin. Now, folks, that's very important. There's those who say that he could have sinned, he might have sinned. Folks, the Bible says he knew no sin. He never sinned. If he had sinned, he would cease to have the potential to be the Son of God. He had to be sinless or he'd have been no different than you and I. Even though he was in bodily form, he, listen, he took on bodily form in the incarnation and he became sin for you and I. He knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Folks, there's no way that we can be made right with God. That's what righteousness means. Listen, our righteousness, Isaiah said, is as filthy rags. Listen, we were born in sin and iniquity, and every motive and every fiber of us is sinful. And the only way that we can have a relationship with Him, the only way that we can spend eternity with Him, listen, is the fact that He knew no sin, and the, and the only way we can be made right with Him, made right with God the Father, is through Him. That's why there's no other way to be saved. That's why there's no other way to heaven whereby me must be saved but Jesus Christ. The scripture is very clear in that. But you see the reason Jesus shows us the loneliness of sin and the loneliness of sin uh, is represented by this darkness. Then I believe it also leads to doom. I believe there's a reminder here that judgment was coming and men better be prepared uh, in this very scripture. He said, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the, notice the phrase, the whole land unto the ninth hour from 12 to 3. Now there's a lot of, uh, there was doom. There was doom that took place in this darkness. Men knew that something phenomenal was happening. Uh, they knew that there was something happening and they had to excuse what was taking place some way. They had to ignore the, the writings of Amos and, and other Old Testament prophets about Jesus Christ prophesying His death on Calvary. But we find that there was doom. But thirdly, we find that there was desolation. Uh, the Bible says very clearly uh, in the ninth hour, the Bible says that there was an earthquake and other references in the Scripture. There was a great earthquake. Uh, look with me, if you will. You say, well, what happened during this darkness and this doom and this time of desolation during this earthquake? Well, I believe I have the answer if you study Scripture and you uh, look to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 4, listen to what Paul said. He said, wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. And gave gifts unto men. Now he, that he ascended, what is but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. 
Now, as you understand what Paul's writing here, he's speaking of the fact of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's talking about spiritual gifts as we move further. But listen, God had given Jesus the gift listen, of dying for your sins and my sins. And listen, we find in accord to that scripture that as he died, uh, the Bible says that he, he ascended. Uh, he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth. What happened in those three days with, while he was in that tomb? What happened? I believe according to Scripture, the Bible says he descended into the lower parts and he, and he set the captives free. First Peter also talks about that. Paul talks about it in Ephesians. And if you study the, the portrait or the idea of uh, uh, hell uh, and prior to the cross, we know that hell was divided into two parts. Uh, there was paradise and there was hell. And we know that Jesus went and he took, he released that part of hell in the grave, uh, those believers under the earth, and he raised them up and he established paradise. That's what he's speaking of. And I believe that's what he was doing in those three days uh, in the process of that tomb. Well, that's just my personal belief because there's other scriptures go with it. Look at verse 34. We find that there was desolation. The Bible says in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he say that, folks? Why? Because he had become sin for the whole world. He became sin. He took on all the filth and the mire and the ungodliness. Listen, on himself. And he satisfied God the Father. He took the worst of you and I and the worst of this world on his back. And listen, he died for that. The Bible says, that, as you read other places in the scripture, uh, the Bible says the veil of the temple was torn in two. Uh, the veil had separated men from God, but now through his death, Jesus opened the door to a new and a living way. Uh, you can jot down Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 12 through verse 22. Well, secondly, as you look at verse 35 and verse 36, by the way, let me go back to verse 34 for just a moment. I think Jack so eloquently touched on this during the Sunday school. As we find the, uh, the word being interpreted here, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father had to turn his back on his son, and Jesus was all alone dying there for your sin and my sin. If you study all through the New Testament, you'll know that Jesus didn't do anything without the agreement of the Father. Everything He did, He had the Father's approval. And everywhere He did, He gave compliment to the Father all through the New Testament. But now, uh, the God the Father has forsaken Him. Why? Because He became sin for the whole world. And verse 35 says, And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, He called Elijah. <laughs> And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus secondly shows us the bitterness of sin. If you read John chapter 19, verse 28, I'll flip over in just a minute. I want you to listen to that scripture because it sort of parallels. You see, Jesus, this, this drink that he took, according to the scripture, um, John says in verse 20, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. If you understand what's happened here, this is twice that they've offered him this drink. We know that one time that he, re he rejected that drink, uh, and Jesus refused to take... There actually, was, this was a type of painkiller they used to cease, ease, ease the pain. And this second drink they give him had a type of narcotic in it to, to reduce the pain, folks. And the reason he refused it was he chose to taste the death and the, to, the bitter, to, to the biggest and big, bitterest degree for you and I. As he declared his thirst, they gave him this drink that was much like really it was referred to as a stinging acid that would have been touched to his mouth. It would ease the pain of death. But he refused it and he took on your sin and my sin. You know... The world does something, uh, they do something to us instead of offering us something uh, that quenches our spiritual thirst, it offers us bitterness, doesn't it? The world tries to satisfy, uh, it tries to satisfy what our, what our normal thirst. 
They try to seduce us with creating thirsts that are unbiblical and they're unscriptural. And the world and the flesh and the devil tries to create uh, desires within us to satisfy us. They're not normal. Uh, they're sinful and they create appetites. And I believe that's a portrait of exactly what they were trying to do. These ungodly people that stand around the foot of the cross are trying here. Listen, he shows us the bitterness of sin through this drink offering. You see, God has given every one of us normal desires, and sin is the attempt to satisfy normal desires in abnormal ways. So as you read verse 35 and verse 36, that's exactly what they were doing. And they 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 begin to they begin to begin to mock and ridicule. And they said, Hey, he he called us Elijah. And one said they one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar. As I've already read it. He put it on a reed, a rod with a with a, with a the end was made to contain this drink. And they gave him the drink. And they said, Let let alone. Let us let him alone. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. You see, the Jewish people revered Elijah, even those that were lost. He shows us the bitterness of sin. Then th thirdly, he shows us the obstructiveness of sin. Verse 37 through verse 90, 39 says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and he gave up the ghost. He died. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that, he, saw that, he so cried out and gave up the ghost. He said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Folks, no one took Jesus' life from him. Jesus gave up his life at Calvary. He gave it freely. Nobody took it from him. Listen, he died for your sins. He died for the sins of these that are at the foot of the cross trying to do the blasphemous things they're doing, offering him this uh, vinegar um, sponge, uh, trying to uh, take care of the pain, which had this uh, acidic uh, content to it. Uh, the temple, if you understand the temple, he makes reference here to it. The veil of the temple was rent. Uh, it was split. You see, the Jews put great, great emphasis on the temple. Their life was all about the temple. Uh, they loved their temple. Uh, they worshipped their temple. And the temple was a really a series of obstructions. It was a series of walls, if you study it. For, there was the court of the Gentiles, where only the Gentiles went. Uh, there was the court of the Jews, where only the Jews could go. There was the court of the women, where only the, the women could go. The women couldn't go in the court of the Jews. They couldn't go into the court of the holies. And, and some say that it was thick as a palm of a hand, uh, this, this veil or this curtain. It was thick. And the Bible says that, listen, it, it, it separated the, the priest and the holy of holies. Uh, and we know that once you got to the... Uh, very end of, of the, uh, there was a mercy seat where the priest would go and he would take that offer and he would put the blood and he would sprinkle on the mercy seat with that hyssop. You see, the temple, folks, was a reminder of the fact that sin keeps human beings from God. And that's what they'd done. That's, they'd turned the temple into a place or object of worship. It was a reminder of the fact, again, that sin keeps human beings from God. And every one of them had their different court they went to. And Jesus reminds us, folks, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. It's not about a Jewish court. It's not about a Gentile court. It's not about a, a women's court. We are, we are the body of Christ. The church is the family of God. And we gather together. We can come, anyone can come. Anyone can go to the mercy seat, not just the high priest. We don't have limitations of worship. We don't have walls and we don't have barriers. Through Jesus, that wall has been torn down. And we can come to Him. We can all pray. We can all sing. We can all shout. Well, listen, we can hear preaching. We can teach. We can come together and we can worship. Worship is one. Isn't that great? So many boundaries and limitations were found in, the, in this system that had been developed. You see, it was a reminder of the fact that sin keeps human beings from God. And Jesus reminds us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 tells us that we have entrance through the veil that is the body of the Lord. Jesus became the veil of the temple. You see, through Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, there are no barriers. Well, I put those three points on your outline, but I went back and I was thinking about something. But you move a little further in this text, there's something interesting if you read it. Uh, the centurion in verse 39, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost. And he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now notice verse 40. There were also women looking on afar off, okay? 
Now, what John Mark fails to tell you here is, <laughs> he wasn't too close himself. <laughs> if you remember, the disciples have scattered. Now, watch as he makes observation. I never really caught this, but here he is. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and, and Salome which also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Now, as you understand that, think about, first of all, uh, lastly, I think Jesus shows us the observation of some. Notice they watched from a distance. They watched from a distance through these women. You know what? Uh, we see their loyalty. We see their loyalty and I believe that, that Mark is looking at these women and he names them here, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome. Uh, 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 he looks at these women and he sees them uh, wa- uh, looking afar off. But he fails to tell you that he's on the run and the rest of these guys have ran and they're in hiding and he's also looking afar off. But he's trying to find a way that they won't see him. But these women... Their loyalty. But then I want you to notice we can't help but to miss their labors. The Bible says in verse 41, and they ministered, they followed him and ministered in him. In other words, they labored for him, they served him, they cared for him. It's what that word actually means, ministered. They cared for Jesus. Not just for his preaching and his teaching. They fed him, they housed him, they cared for him. But I thought that was very interesting. As we think about him writing and inserting these women who are falling afar off, but it's almost like he's excusing himself from doing the same thing. As he makes that observation, I think he's showing us that it's very easy for all of us to follow afar off if we're not careful. But you know what happens? You see, these women, these women, and he, he himself had come across some obstacles. They were following afar off because of some obstacles. They were following afar off. They, had, they knew that they, their lives might be taken too. They could very easily be put to the cross just like the rest. They had realized that there was going to be some barriers to them proclaiming their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And they would learn in the future that there would be some barriers. You see, there was darkness. As you read journey through these verses, you learn that there was darkness at the crucifixion. There was distress at the crucifixion. There was death at the crucifixion. There was dividing at the crucifixion. There was declaration at the crucifixion. And then we find that there was dames, these women at the crucifixion. You see, many of these women served in obscurity. And the point of bringing these women into the scene here is God knows, He knows who, who they are, who they were, and their rewards accordingly. And it's a reminder to you and I. It's a reminder to you and I as we serve. We, we, we serve also sometimes in obscurity. And not everybody's going to see what we do. Everybody's not going to pat us on the back. But God knows who we are, and He knows the rewards that we're going to receive. And He challenges us. Listen, when barriers come to our heart and life, when barriers get in, in the life's road, we've got to do everything we can to avoid those barriers, overcome those barriers, so that we can follow Jesus just a little closer. Well, and there's several other nuggets in this particular text, but that's sort of the, the meat of what's there. I'm glad tonight. There's barriers. We see in this scripture there's self-made barriers. There's, there's religious barriers. There's barriers of fear. Uh, there's barriers of all sorts that we could uh, compile tonight uh, in any given day of doing God's will, honoring God's word. And that's why we need to be full of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to pray. Uh, that's why we need to walk close and stay clean as we can because uh, before the sun goes down, you're probably going to face some type of barrier that tries to hinder your, your relationship and your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be like, you don't have to be like Mark. I believe Mark was following afar off too as he saw these women following afar off. I believe he recognized, he recognized his distance also as he saw their distance, but he didn't have to. He could have stayed closer than he, than he intended to if he'd have stayed faithful. Well, I'm glad 
that he overcame those barriers, and that's why we're reading this book tonight, because it's her, his personal account of the story of his walk and his life in and around Jesus on a daily basis for these three and a half years. What a wonderful, wonderful book. Mark has learned. He's learned how to be a servant. He's learning to be a servant. Well, that's the message tonight. Hope you get some, got some truth out of that. I, I don't know what your barriers are. I don't know what they might be. Uh, but I do know that life's full of barriers. And whatever we do, sometimes the, here's the thing we got to watch out for. We can't allow those barriers to become sin in our life. Because when they do, that's when these other things creep in that we've seen in this text. Let's stand tonight. Denny's going to come and play if he will. I don't know where you're at when you're walking with the Lord tonight. But maybe somewhere along the way, there's some barriers in your life and your relationship and fellowship with the Lord. Maybe you're looking afar off as our heads are bowed and eyes closed like these women were. You see, there were several other reasons why these women were looking afar off. Women were very suppressed. They were suppressed in, 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 by Jewish custom. It wasn't very well accepted by everyone that they were so close to Jesus. But you see, you live in a new generation. You can serve Him and love Him and follow Him as a woman of God, as a man of God. There doesn't have to be any barriers. You have the freedom tonight to pray. You have the freedom tonight to worship. You have the freedom tonight to, to serve Him and honor Him every day of your life. No more barriers. Maybe tonight you come here tonight and maybe there's some barriers tonight in your life. Maybe there's some barriers concerning the will of God for your life. Maybe there's some barriers tonight in relationships. Maybe there's some barriers in your job. Some things you know that you they're, they become uh, troublesome to you and they're blocking your view of God's will. Or your obedience to God's will. Would you come tonight and say, Lord, just give me grace to understand what you're doing, how you're working. What you need me to do as I face these times in my life. In Jesus' name.